infrastructure that goes directly into the New York power grid. Our efforts help promote clean, emissions-free solar power by distributing the facts about solar technology. USES represents a wide range of stakeholders that include farmers, grassroots organizations, youth groups, educational institutions, labor, families, and businesses. We believe it's time for positive change and hope that all of you on this call will help USES accomplish this important step towards a brighter future together. You can visit our website at usesny.org to learn more and get involved, and we'll put that link in the chat. We are recording today's webinar, and that will be available in the next few days on our website as well. We're joined today by Jeremy Varadi of Varadi Farms and Rob Davis, Director of the Center for Pollinators in Energy. There will be time for questions and answers, and I encourage you to use the raise hand function to ask questions. You can reach that by pressing the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then hitting the raise hand button that appears at the bottom of the panel that opens. If you prefer, you can also feel free to use the Q&A button or the chat to pose questions as well. With that, I'll turn it over to Jeremy to get us started, and thank you both for being here. Uh, thanks a lot, Dan, I appreciate it. And uh, yes, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you all today. Um, and uh, yes, I am a farmer from uh, Gasport, New York. And uh, today, I, I, I guess you'll forgive me for a couple things. First of all, there's some noise in the background. We are a full functioning farm. So <laughs> if somebody decides to use a loud tool across the driveway at the shop, I can't really help that. Um, but then also, um, I normally only speak to cows. So I'm uh, privileged to be able to be speaking to you guys today. Um, I am speaking on behalf of myself. I am a part of the USA Steering Committee and, and, and privileged to, to be so. I am speaking on behalf today, just on behalf of myself and the farm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll share screen here and we'll hop into um, this uh, presentation here. Um, okay, I hope you can all um, see this okay. Um, this is uh, my little kids. Um, that's uh, Jack on the right and Sydney on the bottom and my daughter Hattie. Um, on the left. And so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about our farm and about solar uh, today. Um, just a few facts. and I'll go through kind of the history and, and a lot of things about the farm. And forgive me if I'm a little long-winded in doing so. It is something I'm passionate about um, that you'll probably hear. Um, it was called uh, Very Farms early on up until the year 2000. And, and now it's called Variety Farms, which is, is uh, my last name. Um, it's located in Gasport, New York, which is kind of eastern Niagara County. Um, it's a fifth generation farm. I'm the fourth, I'm the fourth generation. Um, it milks about uh, 700 cows and uh, we have about 1,350 head total. That would be including what we would call replacements or, you know, basically calves and heifers. Um, and uh, it, uh, we grow, we care for about 3,000 acres and so we would grow um, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, hay, um, sorghum, and, and organic crops. The, the corn in, in alfalfa, hay, and sorghum, much of that would go to what we would call forages. Um, and uh, it would be, you know, basically chopped up kind of with the moisture in it and be shared with the animals, fed with the animals that way after a fermentation process. And some of the, you know, basically the soybeans and wheat and, and some of the corn we would sell for cash crop as well. And that's where um, solar is, is an option for us. You know, we wanna, e e even with our, our love and, and our desire to be involved in the, in the solar world, uh, it's, it's, we still wanna function as a, as a fully functioning dairy farm. We'd still like to continue that. Um, and some of the, obviously I said earlier, some of the feed is for the animals as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we uh, also have some, some beef cows and some pigs, um, which I have a brother that's very passionate about all kinds of livestock. So um, just some history. I, I took the, the photo on the right this morning, um, which if you ever want to make a farmer look at you funny, run out to your dad and your brother and say, hey, come here for a minute. I want to take a picture of you in the barn um, when they've got plenty else to do. But um, it was, I put some history of Variety Farms. It was established in 1937. Um, so the gentleman on the far left in the black and white photo, and, and please forgive uh, modern technology in that, you know, I guess I just find it interesting that, you know, I'm a millennial and we think we can find everything on the internet. Um, 
but you can't find this on the internet. Uh, this, this picture on the left was on a bulletin board and I took it off and took a picture of my cell phone and you'll see a, a few of those. And, and the, the gentleman on the right there in the black and white photos, my grandfather, John, and, and a lot of this is not on the internet. It's, it's in his head. And of course now maybe it will be on the internet, but it's just kind of interesting that, that uh, he's, he's pretty sharp when it comes to the facts about the farm and in years when things happened and what, what transpired over the generations. But nonetheless, that's them in a flat barn parlor. And the old gambrel roof barns that you'll see as you the dot the countryside, most of them are red. Um, this is the basement of that. And you'll see that kind of going through these, some of these photos, but that's them in, in basically what we would call a flat parlor. Um, so they're going around milking the cows either into a can um, to sell or potentially into a pipeline where it would go into a big stainless tank. And on the right, that's basically the same view of a photo uh, this morning. So that would be, um, you know, basically a barn that was built in the 1890s and probably a picture from the maybe the mid 50s um, and a, part, uh, a picture of, of then my dad, what would be the third and fourth generation, my dad and my brother Ben um, from this morning in 2020. So just uh, pretty cool. So um, just to move on to just some of the updates through the years, the, the parlor, so this again is my grandfather on the left and I, I put the heart of the, the part, milking parlor, the heart of the dairy take three, just to say it was basically a double three parlor. So you milk kind of on two sides. And so this was modern technology in, in 19, and it was the photo in the middle says 1963 when they went away from the basement that I just talked, showed you about. They probably still had cows in there, but they didn't milk in there and they put the parlor in in 1963. So this is them building it. And then I believe that's one of the earlier, it may be the first milk truck to show up and pick up milk. And because to that point it had all been done in cans and just taken up to a depot and gas port here. Um, and then it was, it was updated. So that's, oh yeah. And that's my grandfather on the left standing in front of a little uh, stainless tank. Um, and then it, he, he had started to ship, I believe to uh, Niagara milk producers or Niagara milk in 1942. Um, he had told me, so the farm was bought in 37 and then in 42, he went to that. And that actually maintains today. Um, that was Niagara milk cooperative, which now is part of upstate Niagara from since 2006 is a merger. And then in now that's you, you may from, from the Western New York area, you may know it as the upstate farms brand or uh, it'd be bison dip and some of these other um, brand names, Upstate Farms, that is the, the same cooperative. So it's kind of interesting to watch how that's transpired through the years. Um, they did at one point go to a larger six row barn and then to a double five parlor herringbone, as the term goes, kind of how the cow comes into the parlor. And this is kind of what it looks like today. Uh, double 10 um, parlor, 10 cows on each side. And we've added some technology throughout the years. Um, and moving along, I, I, you know, we've had to add acres um, to be able to feed the animals throughout the years, but we've also had to change some of um, how, you know, basically how we store the feed. Um, and, you know, in the, in the picture on the left, you can see sort of upright silos around that gambrel roof barn. And that's kind of how the feed was stored. And then I believe in the late seventies, this A-frame, they call it bunker silo was put in to store the feed. Um, and so you can just kind of see that the, the transformation is even in, in those kind of technologies as far as upright silos to bunk silos through the years. Um, and then, yeah, this is just the, the barn today. And then, and then the barn, the barn a while ago, kind of the old and new. Um, but uh, so just as far as me specifically, I was uh, raised in this, uh, raised on the farm. And, you know, sometimes I, I joke when you hear a politician say that, you know, I was raised on a farm. Sometimes they were raised you know, up the road, across the road from a barn and, and maybe haven't seen an animal recently. But then there were some of us who were, and forgive me for maybe a little bit of my tone, some of us were actually had to, to work on the farm each day and, and those kind of things. And I was um, probably more the latter, but uh, I digress. Um, so I grew up right on the farm with a large family of six. Um, I remember just one quick story. I used to ride my bike everywhere and would be able to, uh, run and grab a part or a tool from the shop and I could run, ride my bike up there really quickly. Well, I was tending to be quite excited when I got back. So sometimes I would leave it and, and a tractor would potentially run it over, which some of you might think that was kind of gruesome, but 
if you've ever seen it, obviously I was nowhere around. I just left the bike in the driveway. But uh, if you've ever seen a Husky bike after it's been run over by a four wheel drive tractor, it's not a terribly pretty sight. Um, but I would do uh, chores and whatnot and, and it grew up kind of that way. Um, I ended up going full time after I graduated from UV or University of Buffalo with a bachelor's of science degree and uh, in, in 2006 and I went full time at the farm um, doing uh, book work and whatnot, a lot of the QuickBooks and the financial stuff. And uh, I was married that year as well. Um, this is a picture of me uh, with kind of my brothers and a lot of family on the left there. And that's me and my wife, Stephanie, on the left, uh, very left-hand side of the photo. And then that's also me and a tractor, um, kind of in that early 2000s range. Um, I had accepted, 2009 was a very difficult year. If you go up to any dairy farmer and you just say 2009, uh, you might just as well see the blood drain from their face because they remember that year um, very vividly just because it was such a tough year financially. And you know, the financial crisis had happened and, um, but dairy markets were extremely challenging through that time. And I had really struggled and I, I, I decided to pursue a, uh, a um, off-farm job with one of the vendors um, that worked uh, kind of alongside our farm. And so um, I accepted that, I think in late 2010. And uh, anyway, uh, as things sometimes can happen in, in, in sudden changes, my wife at the time, Stephanie, was on her way to work. Um, in a, on a morning in December in 2010, and she was, um, she unfortunately passed away in a car accident uh, that day. And so uh, my life kind of changed really quickly. Um, and I was uh, kind of had to readjust and I actually ended up staying on the farm um, and continuing to kind of work through that. And uh, it was still a challenging time, but you know, and I, you know, God had allowed me to have a good family around me and, uh, and to be able to kind of lean on my faith through that time. And I chose to stay with agriculture. And then um, in 2012, um, speaking of the barn, I was able to be um, married to my wife, Rachel. Um, and we were able to use that same barn. We kind of revamped it. And um, you can see here a couple of photos of the wedding that day, um, which was really fun. So it was kind of fun to be in a barn that was was built in the 1890s and, and you know, um, hand chopped beams. And we got to uh, be married in that. And it was really cool cool time. And we began to have kids after that. And I showed you earlier, Jack, Hattie, and Sydney. Um, and they're really why I, I work the way I do. And, and, and the reason for my, uh, one of the main reasons for my passion for agriculture, um, there's more than that. I mean, there's uh, giving employees jobs, um, watching things grow, taking care of animals, a feeling of accomplishment at the end of the day, uh, beautiful sights and sounds and smells sometimes. Um, is supporting other small businesses um, and also our local communities and, and teaching people about agriculture and the list goes on. Um, and my two brothers and I, uh, Daniel and Ben and my dad, um, have worked really hard to grow this business over the last decade and, and, and it's had its challenges, uh, believe, that, believe me. Most days we're thankful um, that as the Bible says, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and uh, we're ultimately working working that way and working for him. Um, 20, uh, 20, um, oh yeah, these are just a couple quick pictures here of my kids. So this is just as the time goes, my, my son Jack on the left and then him and I this winter on the right. He was about six months old and he brought me lunch and the tractor on the left. And then uh, this is my daughter Hattie. Um, she came to help me one day um, in the field and then uh, she got her little Mickey Mouse glasses on there. And then this is my son, Sydney, my youngest. Um, and, and the, you know, that's really the goal is to pass an operation on to the next generation. Um, so 2015, 2016, 17 and 18 for dairy were all challenging years. And it was early in 2019 that I, uh, I got a call from, from a gentleman who was, who was working on a solar project. And, uh, it, it actually is still one of the developers I'm working with today. And I gave him a bit of an earful. It had been a tough morning. And uh, I was a little bit sick of talking about um, potential, having potential solar folks show up, which is, this is actually one of the reasons why I'm, I wanted to be part of USIS. Just people that were sort of interested and they would come and kind of get you excited about a solar project and then walk away. And so I found it pretty intriguing that this gentleman knew, knew what was up and knew kind of what was going on and was able to 
um, have a real conversation. He knew a lot about the town locally and we were able to kind of move forward from there. And uh, it was a good conversation. As I said in this picture, it was, I was about as excited once by the end of this phone call as it was for me to take my son out to look at the calf hutches, as you can see in the picture there. Um, and I had a willingness to have a conversation. The infrastructure was there, which I had seen these large power lines kind of going overhead actually right near one of our fields. Um, and the time was right. And so um, there's a lot to love about solar. Um, to me, there's three things. Um, and uh, I'll kind of just go into these quickly. Um, to me, solar is gen generous. Um, the income per acre is fair and can allow for diversification as well, as we'll talk about um, here more in a minute. Um, and it can allow for um, generational transfer. It's a, solar is generational. It can allow for the, the, you know, the goal is to pass this on, the farm on. Farmers are leaving the industry um, in large numbers. And I'll talk about that again more in a second and solar is green. Um, I love the term creation care. Um, the idea is that to whom, to whom much is given, much is required, and agriculture is doing a lot of good. Um, we're, we're trying to be more efficient with, with our uses of, of water and um, better with cover crops, um, less chemicals. We're doing a lot of good, um, but we wanna continue that, and we wanna continue to uh, deepen our responsibility to the planet um, through technology and efficiency. And uh, just kind of in closing, you know, we want to pass on the farm and the planet. And, and uh, as far as, you know, the generousness of the farm, it, you know, it can be uh, generous to, to local farmers and can also be generous to, to local towns through pilots. And uh, it can allow for us to weather, um, weather the weather, if you will, and uh, to weather the storms of today and tomorrow. And, uh, even it allows us to, for agrivoltaics, which I'll close with here at the bottom. Um, but, you know, farming can be hard. The, the barriers of entry are high. Um, it takes a lot of capital to get involved. Um, I've been blessed to be part of an operation that could kind of pass it down to me where I had that opportunity. Um, and I want to continue that. There's a lot of dairy farms going out of business. There's uh, U.S. lost 20,000 licensed dairy farms in the last decade. Um, and in New York lost 380 in 2019 alone. Um, and, and the numbers around 3,800 um, that are left. Uh, and um, let me, oh, sorry. And there, we're seeing a lot of consolidation amidst increases in regulation and cost increases overhead. Um, this steady green income can allow for, for a farm to continue its legacy. Solar doesn't smell, it isn't noisy and it's not muddy or dusty. And we get those complaints, I'll say somewhat often, my cell phone will ring and, and it will be one of those issues. So I believe solar is a great neighbor. Um, and it's not an either or, it's a both and. And we'll talk more about, we'll hear more about pollinators in a minute, but um, I do feel like uh, there's, there's, as far as agrivoltaics, it's pretty cool. You know, it allows for that diversification and, and it will allow you to, if you will, share the light um, through multiple things, being able to harvest that light, part of the property going to, to electricity and, and part of the, the, uh, the sunlight going to bees or sheep and growing grass for sheep and those kinds of things. Um, so just in closing, you know, there's no, no, I, as I put here, there's no apology, uh, for yesterday in agriculture. It's, it's, uh, the caveat is this can be true in all businesses and, and in all walks of life, but yesterday's sick animal or weather event employee that quit or a rock that appeared out of nowhere and went through a machine and wrecked a machine. It doesn't matter. It's 7 a.m. and it's time to go to work. And I'm thankful for the generations that, the, that have gone before me and have taught me how to, to focus on what we can control in agriculture. And there's a lot that, you, because there's a lot that you can't control. And, and I believe uh, solar is, is a, a good opportunity. So Thank you. Oh yes, and I did uh, put the got milk in the bottom left-hand corner there, just for those of you that didn't know what I was passionate about this part of the presentation. So, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to Rob and uh, I want to thank folks for the great questions that are already coming in. We're going to hold those to the end, um, but please do continue to send them and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So thanks again, Jeremy and Rob, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much and great to be with you. Jeremy, I loved your presentation and uh, it's great to, you know, to be able to join you in this presentation. I had a, a big glass of milk as well as milk in my coffee this morning. Um, it was fantastic. Um, I did a, a, a TEDx talk a couple of years ago where I got to share with the audience that, you know, we don't just need pollinators for our fruits and vegetables um, and our coffee. But we also need, you know, pollinators for our dairy uh, because alfalfa, you know, is a pollinator dependent crop and it requires those visits from bees to flowers, you know, in order to produce alfalfa seeds so we can continue to produce those things for the livestock we eat. So it's not just about how pollinators benefit us directly. It's about how pollinators benefit the feedstock that we give to, you know, our, our dairy cows and those, uh, those, those pigs that make that delicious bacon. So, you know, people don't think about, you know, bacon and milk being pollinator dependent crops, but it's an important part of the supply chain. Um, so it's great to be with you all uh, around lunchtime and um, great to be able to talk about food and energy and the nexus between those things. Uh, I'm Rob Davis and I run the Center for Pollinators and Energy where we think long and hard about how to maximize the benefits of our transition to clean energy um, and, and do that in ways that advance uh, accelerated adoption of innovative solar farm designs that, uh, that stack these benefits together. So um, I'm gonna share some visuals uh, to help make some of these points, um, but just to uh, share as well, uh, the nonprofit organization I work for is called Fresh Energy. Uh, we work nationwide on the topic of pollinator friendly solar and low impact solar. And uh, we've been around for, oh, I guess going on 25 some odd years now. Um, and, uh, um, and really think about, um, about, again, how to maximize the benefits to our, our rural communities, our urban communities, to all the constituencies, um, and do that with clean energy and energy efficiency and uh, related technologies. So that's a little bit about us. Um, what I do day in and day out is think long and hard about how the design of a system like this one creates potentially a big problem for, you know, for some communities. Because, you know, solar got its start in the desert southwest, you know, some very arid portions of the country in Arizona and California, where there's really not a lot of vegetation growing on, on those, those BLM lands, you know, those, uh, uh, those Bureau of Land Management lands. And, you know, when you're confronted with pictures like this and like this, you know, uh, then you start to design systems for, you know, for the parts of the country that have arable land and high quality farmland. So this is a project here where they've trucked in, you know, acres and acres of class five gravel uh, at considerable, considerable, extraordinary expense, in fact, um, because, hey, these are the civil engineering designs we had for those power plants in the desert in California or our substations, you know, in other parts of the country. So we'll just take those templates and then apply them to a different context. But unfortunately, when solar looks like this, you know, with the razor wire and the gravel, it looks like a intense um, energy industrial use. It does not reflect the rural character that we're used to. It does not reflect the values of conservation and stewardship and innovation that are regularly practiced in, you know, our farming communities. So, um, you know, when we found out about this in Minnesota, my colleagues uh, worked on a, on a policy um, that basically resulted in Minnesota uh, having a tremendous solar, uh, solar growth. So several hundred megawatts of solar uh, in a short period of time. And we got a call from, uh, from a farmer in rural Minnesota that said, what are you guys doing? Isn't all this solar gonna just ruin? you know, thousands of acres of farmland. And we knew just from that one signal that we needed to deploy uh, innovation and find ways to design these projects so that they were compatible with the values of agriculture and the values of conservation, the values that are common throughout rural parts of the country. Um, so a research project led us to this picture. I think you can still Google biodiversity and solar and find this picture. Uh, this uh, from this project, um, West Mill Solar Farm, outside uh, about 100 miles outside of London, give or take. And so we called up this ecologist, Dr. Guy Parker, and said, 
this looks fantastic. This looks like a prairie or a meadow. You know, what went wrong? <laughs> What's the catch? And, uh, you know, and, and he shared all of the things that, that were challenges, but also the things that were really meaningful opportunities. And so, you know, you can see how it's not just the, 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 the butterflies and the bees, but it, there's a hoverfly here and, a, and an inchworm that are enjoying the, the habitat under and around these panels. So now that we knew that, hmm, that there was something here, um, we started sharing this information and telling more people about it and finding rural electric cooperatives, actually, like Conexus Energy, the largest rural electric cooperative in Minnesota. They had already planted their 245 kilowatt, you know, uh, one and a quarter acre uh, solar farm back in 2014 to be a, a beautiful flowering meadow. This was, you know, six years ago now. And these pictures are still just as beautiful and the site is still just as beautiful. And amazingly, it requires just one annual mow. And that I think is something that is a really interesting opportunity for the solar developers in the audience. And also, you know, the energy buyers and, you know, the community members. Why design a solar farm for six or 10 annual mows? Why do that, right? You know, you don't need, you know, I'm pretty sure that like, acres and acres and acres of gas fired, you know, mowers isn't part of my version of the clean energy future. Let's design something so that we, we minimize the use uh, of those mowers. Um, and so that project has inspired so many others like this one by Minnesota Power and a partner project they did with Camp Ripley, a US uh, Army Reserve base, a 10, 10 megawatt, 62 acre project on the Mississippi River. Uh, this one in, in Vermont and several others in Vermont with Green Lantern and other partners. Uh, D.E. Shaw and Minnesota Native Landscapes have a gorgeous project, 1,000 acres, North Star Solar, uh, that's all pollinator friendly. And Aurora Solar with an L Green Power. Again, uh, beautiful projects, and they're really maximizing the, the use and making a productive use of the land under and around the panels. Uh, Aurora is also a research project for the National Renewable Energy Lab, which I'll mention in a few minutes. And we just have some interesting opportunities, though, right? So this is a traditional corner beans field that, uh, that the landowners have now leased. Uh, this is in, uh, in Wisconsin, actually. And the landowners are getting up toward an age. They wanted to diversify their revenue. They leased some land to NG. And you know, sure enough, a year and a half later, they had a beautiful flowering meadow. Uh, and a year and a half after that, it was just, acres of flowering plants. Uh, these are all black eyed Susans that you see in yellow. There's a lot of diversity in the seed mixtures as well that you can't see from this height. Um, but the, these, these projects have just a beautiful natural charisma. You know, there's a lot of solar pictures where they're taken from a different angle and it looks like you've converted 500 acres to glass and steel and silicon. And that might be super attractive to a solar developer, but out in rural America, People have a different reaction, right? It's like, oh my God, what are you guys doing? So, um, so it's important that we think about this. Now, I, I like to use this slide to talk about how this strategy and this design approach has a severe, severe limitation. It only works where plants grow. So here you can see an NG project in Texas. You know, this shows that like we don't have to have bare ground. We don't have to have uh, you know gravel or, or turf grass. We can think and, and apply innovation to, you know, you can have a variety of different species that do provide a meaningful but incremental benefit to pollinators within the operating constraints of a utility scale solar farm. So uh, Denison University is getting a lot of great PR. Uh, this is in Ohio for their beautiful project. Uh, University of Dayton is doing about the same thing. Here's a little bit before and after picture. This site is just tremendously beautiful. Um, it's right in the center of campus. And then, you know, since I showed a Wall Street Journal headline before, I thought you'd like to see another Wall Street Journal headline from just last fall. And this is a drone shot of the construction of an NG pollinator friendly solar farm adjacent to a soybean field uh, outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, really, you know, helps the media think about and frame these solar farms as uh, something different that is not a conversion of crop to industrial use. It's just a different kind of agriculture. 
And that's important. It's not just the pollinators that benefit from these sites. It's also the deep rooted plants that stabilize the soil, add soil organic matter over and, and improve the quality of the soil over the life of the project. So adding a solar panel to this picture, you can see, you know, the six inches of turf grass on one side of the screen versus the six feet, 12 feet or more of those deep rooted native meadow plants. Um, that really provide that soil stabilization function, improving the quality of that soil, capturing the groundwater when it's coming off the panels. And since I mentioned groundwater, I should mention that the National Renewable Energy Lab has an ongoing research project right now, it's just started. Uh, it's called PV Smart, and it's looking at the hydrologic performance of these systems. So, you know, why are we leasing extra land to do stormwater containment basins? What if the data shows that the resources we use to do stormwater containment basins would be better used, you know, buying higher performance plant material to manage that stormwater. So that's one of the things that NREL is looking at is understanding the balance of system costs between the vegetation and uh, other solar farm designs. It's not the only research project that NREL is doing. Uh, they're also looking at uh, the compatibility with agriculture and, and, uh, and the environment for these projects in the INSPIRE study, which stands for Innovative Site Preparation and Impact Reductions on the Environment. And some of those initial results with a coalition of partners nationwide uh, is you know, the opportunity to create habitat for pollinators, the opportunity, particularly in the West and more arid regions, to create shade for, uh, for, uh, for crops that might get, have their surfaces burned by the intense sun, uh, and other interesting uh, dual use functions. So this, is, uh, this research is showing great promise. Um, and just on the pollinators uh, aspect of the INSPIRE study, it's showing that uh, as this, as you can see here, the flowering vegetation inside the fence, just like those pictures I showed you a few minutes ago, inside the fence of the solar farm meaningfully benefits or can meaningfully benefit the crops grown outside the fence. The bees don't care about the fence. You'd be shocked, I know. But those native, those little native bees, they're, you know, they really care about the flowers. They really don't care about, you know, the solar operator, but they're going to do more visits to those squash and those pumpkins and those apples and those cherries. And particularly in a state like New York, you know, with all of the apples uh, and all of the pollinator dependent crops in New York state, you know, there's a great opportunity to stack these functions and have, you know, sanctuaries of pollinator habitat that provide an agricultural service for nearby crops. So what constitutes pollinator friendly is critical as well, because you know, I'll just sh share, you don't want to do a veneer, right? We all know the phrase, and I love that it comes from farming, of putting lipstick on a pig. And I am in no way saying that all solar is ugly, but I am saying some solar is ugly, right? Those, those pictures that we opened with, the idea of doing gravel solar on uh, you know, farmland in New York State, that would be uh, a, a great loss. So, um, so thankfully there are great uh, useful standards established by some of the nation's foremost ex experts on pollinators. Dr. Marla Spivak, is, uh, uh, her TED talk has like 3 million views. Uh, she's a MacArthur Genius Award winner. She answers her own phone. <laughs> and thank goodness she did uh, because she helped us understand what is a meaningful compromise to provide benefits to pollinators uh, within the operating constraints of a solar farm. How can we do something that's better than turf grass, that's better than just doing a veneer, you know, that would actually incrementally improves the function of the, uh, the core uh, vegetation on, that, on those solar farms. So there's a series of pollinator-friendly solar scorecards. They're all on our website. It's a very simple tool, provides a great deal of flexibility, um, and is very cost effective. So there's all kinds of landscape contractors, not, not turf grass contractors, but other landscape contractors that can use these tools to uh, present a, you know, cost effective solutions to the solar industry. And, uh, and this is a really great point for, uh, not just for agriculture, but also for solar, because the solar community with these tools gets to stand side by side with Purdue University, with the University of Minnesota, with Cornell University and say, hey, we're following their guidance as to what constitutes beneficial to pollinators. And, uh, and we're implementing those practices on our solar farms. So these public policies and standards are in place in many, many places. 
Uh, the state of Michigan, I'll highlight uh, specifically, has opened 3 million acres of uh, ag preserve land to solar development. It was a previously a prohibited use, but now it's an open use on the condition that the projects are pollinator friendly. Uh, Massachusetts has also created some incentives for pollinator habitat on their solar farms. Um, and we expect that this is a trend that will continue to accelerate uh, nationwide. Um, what we know as well, you know, based on this story from PV Magazine, is that on the, uh, on the, on the cost side for the developer, it's effectively, what, what do they say, less than a penny a watt. So it's not a material change in, in cost, you know, compared to uh, one vegetation, you know, a perennial vegetative cover that you need for stormwater management versus perennial vegetative cover with flowers to benefit pollinators. So there's also some performance benefits as well, which we're working with NREL right now to model. We know already that bare ground on a solar farm creates a heat island effect. And we know for the first time based on a study published last October that crops and thick vegetation grown under panels creates a cooler microclimate, significantly cooler. In fact, improving the generation of the panels by 2%. So we're currently studying how thick does the vegetation need to be on a pollinator friendly solar project to create that cooling benefit. We do know as well, the world is getting warmer. So if you're a developer, if you're working with a developer, you know, really talk to that developer about how are you mitigating the negative effects of heat that are coming in a warming world. The benefits of this uh, strategy have been well documented and researched as well as some of the challenges. Um, and these have all been addressed uh, time and time again in our work on this topic over the last five years. There's plentiful seed supply, OSHA issues can be handled with proper preparation, uh, and there's reduced risk from having a cooler microclimate uh, on, these, uh, on these projects. So let's talk bees. <laughs> First, Winnie the Pooh has cursed us. We all are walking around with this curse of knowledge of like, oh, I see a, a hornet nest up in the tree, and I think there's honey in that. No. There's no honey in hornet's nests, right? Okay, so the things that hang in trees, those are hornet's nests, right? Hornets are carnivorous. They like to eat other insects. So they are aggressive and you know they sting and they sting repeatedly. So those hornets, bad. Honeybees, they're the sheep of the bee world. Native bees and, uh, and native uh, pollinators are really much more interested in, in flowers than they are in people. And they're solitary, native bees nest in the ground. So honeybees are in honeybee hives like the ones pictured here. Hornets are in those paper wasps. And of course, you know, there's other kinds of paper wasp nests that you'll see on solar projects. Those will be there whether there's flowers or not. So that's just something that happens. Um, so, but co-locating a pollinator friendly solar farm with honey production is a fantastic opportunity. It was featured in the World Changing Ideas section a fast company a couple years ago with John Jacob of Old Soul Apiaries out in Oregon. He's just a fantastic beekeeper. I've got my consultant here on, uh, <laughs> on bees and honey, uh, official taste tester. So, um, and also another, another taste tester is, uh, is this gentleman who's the commissioner of agriculture for the state of Minnesota, Tom Peterson. He helped Dustin Vanassa Bear Honey open the first frame of uh, solar grown honey uh, from the 2019 harvest. And so Dustin and Bear Honey have been tending hives on pollinator friendly solar farms for uh, a couple of years now. Um, and, uh, and not just in Minnesota, but throughout the Midwest. So uh, it's really a, a terrific collaboration. Um, that said, I should caution you if you're in the solar development industry, one, nobody ever got like, uh, became a billionaire from honey, right? You don't know of any like honey billionaires. And there's a good reason for that. One, to be a, a, a beekeeper, you have to be comfortable with getting stung in the nose, in the nose, which is enough to dissuade a lot of us from deciding to work with you know, thousands of bees on a regular basis. However, there are some really best practices that we've published, not just on our website, but also in all the major beekeeping publications in the United States. So start with the pollinator friendly solar project, hire an experienced beekeeper, 
you know, you want to make sure <laughs> that you don't, you don't work with a hobbyist. And I only say that I have a great love for hobbyist beekeepers, but um, if there's honey that's being attributed to your solar project, um, you have a brand risk and a reputation. So you want to make sure that is handled in a, in a food safe way. Um, and, um, and so if it's available commercially or it's given, uh, you know, people don't want to, you know, uh, get sick from something and have it be attributed to the solar farm or something like that. Um, so work with professionals. Um, dedicate a space outside the fence. Uh, that's the easiest thing to do. Then the, the lawyers, the insurance companies are calm and cool about it. Make sure it's accessible to pickup trucks. That's how beekeepers work. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and then just like come to an agreement with your beekeeper about how much you as a solar developer are going to buy, um, or other things that said, you know, beekeeping is based on a lot of windshield time. So not every solar project or even every pollinator friendly solar project is necessarily good, good for a beekeeper. You know, they like, like to find places where they can group up hives and minimize their windshield time. Just like, just like anybody. Um, Big levers that we can all pull and push on are procurement um, so that corporations can say, hey, I want pollinator friendly solar. And in fact, this is a huge trend we're seeing nationwide. Just to, just to wrap up my remarks, you know, that Cliff Bar, Organic Valley, more and more corporations are saying, yes, we want the clean energy. And also we want more. And that's what Connexus Energy is doing. So we see this not just in the corporate space, we see this in the utility space, we see this in the, in the university space. Xcel Energy is now requiring these pollinator-friendly solar scorecards in their procurement. So bringing this kind of innovation to scale is a really exciting time for dual-use solar that really provides a lot of benefits. So here's just some of the companies that are doing that are asking for pollinator-friendly solar in their procurement: Cliff Bar, Organic Valley, Aveda, Bank of America, Purdue Farms, you know, and educational institutions like Pittsburgh, uh, University of Pittsburgh, Penn State, and others. So this is really a tremendous. Uh, um, you know, to accelerate adoption of dual use solar. And that's, uh, that's the key of my, of my remarks. And I'm really thankful for your time. Um, so I look forward to the, the conversation and questions and all of the information about our work is on our, our website, just beeslovesolar.org. Thank you so much, Rob. It's a fascinating presentation and, um, such an important topic. Um, we have a couple of questions that are related to what you were just speaking about, so I thought we could start there. Um, first of all, if, if you could give us a little more of an understanding of what the wholesale market looks like for honey, about whether that's there's volatility there, kind of, but if you could tell us more about what the wholesale market for honey looks like, uh, we could start there. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, honey is an interesting commodity. Um, unfortunately, there's no um, there's no national definition. The U USDA does not have a national definition for what constitutes honey. So unfortunately, that's resulted in a lot of honey fraud, where you see honey being imported um, from a lot of different countries that is blended with uh, things and, uh, and then marketed as, as honey. So, um, you know, so it's, it's a challenge. Um, but honey is frequently handled by the barrel, um, like 50 gallon barrel. And so, you know, commercial and experienced beekeepers and honey packers, um, you know, will move barrels around the country uh, to provide it at, at, at wholesale prices to, uh, uh, to uh, large, you know, large uh, food in industry businesses. Uh, retail is a very different. Unfortunately, a lot of honey is treated like, oh, you know, we expect the farmer to uh, harvest the wheat and then sell Wheaties. And, um, and so there's very different uh, approaches to doing uh, honey production at commercial scale uh, versus uh, hobbyist or what they call sideliner honey. But the, the average honey you know, price, uh, wholesale prices are published on, I think on a quarterly basis in Bee Culture and American Beekeeping Federation, um, places where we've published some of these best practices. Thank you for that. We've got a couple more related that I'll, I'll stick with you for. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions asking about the timing for when a, uh, a solar farm is established, knowing that a lot of times these stabilized surfaces are established at a non-traditional planting time of the year, and asking how, how you can figure out the plant 
plantings when you're in a cold climate like New York and your solar farm is completed outside of the normal planting window. And related to that, whether you have any recommendations on specific seeding mixtures that would achieve this one mow per year uh, maintenance standard rather than what some folks have seen more typically with having to maintain that more frequently. Absolutely. Well, I'll actually ask Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, what uh, what do you guys tend to use? What's What are some popular cover crops? Um, because what we see is that cover crops are a great way to seed if you close out your, you know, if you need to close out your construction, but you're not ready to seed your pollinator friendly mix, you'd use a cover crop. Yeah. Um, so, um, it's, first of all, Rob, great job. Um, I, I was taking notes and, and I was pretty intrigued by everything you were saying. Um, super interesting. Uh, yeah, so we've uh, continued to get into cover cropping more and more. Um, and an example, uh, actually we're, we're doing a lot of it now to get ready for winter. Um, and um, some of the stuff we're doing, a lot of it is uh, to do with uh, breaking up what they would call the hard pan or certain certain uh, difficult or hard spots in the soil in between planting crops like corn and soybeans. So I know like you'll have soybeans in there, you'll have oats in there, uh, but I know like uh, they call them tillage radishes is a popular one that's in there. And there's a lot more to a blend of it. I, I don't have a list handy, um, but yes, they're extremely valuable for organic matter, for soil health, and also for uh, production of nitrogen when you um, till them under to be able to use the to be able to plant a crop the following year. Yeah, we we hear about those as well as uh, like a winter wheat or an oats um, are pretty popular. But so you know, landscape contractors like Ernst Pollinator Services in New York State in the region, um, they will know exactly what cover crop would be appropriate for the type of soil and the weather conditions that that these um, projects have. Um, and certainly if there's slope issues or, um, you know, ENS or, you know, erosion issues, um, about erosion. like them, yeah. landscape contractors can handle those issues as well. Um, the other part of that question, Daniel, was aside from cover crops. Oh, designing the one mo system. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I love is that we, you know, we are, uh, we've, we've sent men to the moon like years and years and years ago, decades ago. So can we figure out how to do uh, a one mo system for solar farms everywhere in the United States? Absolutely we can. Um, it starts definitely with just asking the question and looking at the vegetation as a strategic priority. Usually the vegetation is less than 1% of the budget. And most of the civil engineers don't have a lot of training on the vegetation. So, uh, so the first is just saying, going into the projects with saying, hey, we're going to prioritize this so that we have a one mo system uh, at the end of it. Um, one of the things that we see is a, is a helpful tool is to get the lower edge of those panels up. You know, National Renewable Energy Lab is now recommending 36 inches for the lower edge as a best practice. Uh, I was on three different utility scale projects last week, a uh, week before last, that were at 42, excuse me, 40, 40, and 44 inches for the lower edge of that panel. When you have panels up that high, you get more indirect light under the panels. Uh, if you if you have bifacials, that's great. You get more reflect, reflected light. You have better soil stabilization, um, but you also have more time between when you know the vegetation starts to grow and when it reaches and then starts to shade the panels. So the ideal system is you know designing something that crowds out the invasives, um, but it, it is best paired with panels that are you know, 36 to 44 inches off the ground. Still low enough to allow a contractor to stand with two feet on the ground, you know, and put the panels on and screw them in, uh, but high enough to allow the mowers to move faster uh, when they have to do uh, mowing on the site just once a year. Thank you both. So, so again, sort of on, on this topic, I've got a pair of questions uh, asking for, your take on removing a mature forest to put up solar panels or on using unused prime farmland for solar panels. Do you want me to take that? Jeremy, sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. Well, I'd love your perspective first and then I can chime yeah, in as well. I, no, I don't, I don't want to take out forest for it. No way. Uh, it's, it's expensive. It's a lot of work. Um, I don't, I think there's enough um, ground in production right now. I think, largely across this country, 
I would call, I would say that there's an oversupply in agriculture, uh, meaning that, you know, we're, we're doing our darndest to export product. Um, and, you know, there's a variety of things going on with COVID and stuff, which are complicated that I won't go into, but largely there's a lot of production in this country from agri. So I think to take, you know, some percentage points and put it to producing electricity is really exciting, but I, I'm not for, um, I would say clear cutting uh, forests. As far as prime farmland, um, uh, that term is, uh, the term prime is maybe overused a fair bit. It's, it's part of the state's description and there's kind of basic descriptions of, on state maps of what's prime, prime with drain, drainage as you look across the state. But I will say just as a general rule, if you ask a farmer what is prime ground or what we'll call good, good dirt, if you'll forgive the, the, uh, the basic term, um, we know what it is. And I think it's important for um, everybody to pay attention to try and not take the best ground and put it to soil. Um, but there's a lot of ground that I would say is available that could be used well for solar and um, that would not affect a lot of these other um, productive acres. And really, um, you know, tide raises all boats. If you would have some ground come out of production for maybe corn and soybeans or whatever, you would and then be helping your neighbor because you would, um, you would, you would then be helping your neighbor because you're then, you know, you're then uh, taking some of that ground out of production and putting it to, to electricity or to helping pollinators and, and sort of the like. So that would be my take, Rob. What do you think? Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. I, I don't really get into the siting and the locational issues um, because they're so complicated. You know, why should we reward or punish one farmer or one landowner, you know, because they've either been doing good soil health practices, you know, cover cropping every year, whereas their neighbor maybe hasn't. Uh, and so their, their neighbor's land is degraded to be very poor land um, or, you know, rewarding one farmer or another because they happen to have some forested acres. Um, you know, there's a lot of also timber land around the country and, you know, timber and forestry is a, is a real, is a real thing and it happens all around the country. Um, so I, I, it's hard to say, like, just like, you know, the word prime farmland, the, the, the term prime farmland is a bit loaded. The term forest can also be a bit loaded um, because maybe that's land that has been, you know, timbered every, you know, 30 or 40 years going back, you know, a few generations. Um, so it depends. Um, that said, uh, I'm not at all about to say uh, that the pollinator habitat makes up for the forest. Absolutely not. You know, the, the carbon storage potential for a forest is tremendous. Um, and, you know, pollinator friendly vegetation is not a mitigation strategy for that. That said, if the solar is going to be built, we can do better than turf grass. And that's really what I work on is is looking at like, if you're going in planning to build with gravel, planning to build with turf grass, you know, is there's an opportunity to do something that provides more benefit in terms of the, you know, sequestered carbon, the uh, water management and the ecosystem services to the pollinators. A group from Yale University uh, last year or the year before actually did a whole modeling study where they said, if you have a given parcel, say 400 acres and you take a middle 50, you know, acres and put it in a pollinator friendly solar farm. And then around the outside, you plant pollinator dependent crops, you know, strawberries, apples, melons, stuff like that. The increase in production from outside the fence, from the crops outside the fence, more than offsets the hmm. land taken out of production. So it's an innovative way to think about, you know, how a solar farm provides um, revenue stabilization to allow a farmer to stay on their farm uh, to not file for bankruptcy, to not be subject or so subject to commodity, you know, prices and trade wars. Um, and, you know, it also ties into like, what constitutes a productive use? You know, does, does helping sustain the monarch butterfly constitute a productive use of prime farmland? You know, does, do, do farmers have responsibility, just like homeowners, to provide some habitat to keep the, you know, monarch butterfly from becoming an endangered, you know, endangered species. Um, solar farms seem like a very cost-effective way for farmers to take a lot of credit for habitat 
Um, and then, you know, hold the, hold the stick over the homeowners and the suburban, you know, the suburban uh, developers to say, hey, where's your pollinator habitat? You know, we're, we're, we're out here feeding America and providing the habitat. You know, we'd like to see some flowering, uh, you know, parks and uh, soccer fields, if you don't mind. <laughs> so. That's great. Well, we're coming up on the hour, and so we're unfortunately not going to be able to get to everyone's questions. We will try to follow up with those of you who we have not answered uh, afterwards via email. Um, I want to ask one, one more set of questions. A couple of folks have asked whether there is a pollinator credit program in New York State, and more generally, how solar farms can maximize, on, maximize the benefits from credit programs for ecosystem services and soil enhancement and carbon sequestration. Um, I'm going to start with, with you, Rob, on this, if you have an answer. And Jeremy, I'd like to hear from you, too, if you have any experience with this directly. Yeah, I would, I would definitely encourage solar developers and landowners to, to take baseline measurements. So before you build the solar project, take baseline measurements of the soil carbon and the pollinator abundance and get baseline measurements for those ecosystem services. Um, because today, there's not a mature market for those services, but it is absolutely likely that that, that will emerge within the next five to 10 years. Um, there's a whole category of firms that do something called mitigation banking, where you can kind of do a lot of environmental harm over here, and then you buy credits for stuff over here. I, I tend to think of that as very different than pollinator-friendly solar, because mitigation banking is like, hey, I'm gonna do something that might be really harmful, but um, somewhere else, I'll do something you know, wonderful. Um, what's really hard about that is that the person driving by the solar farm day in and day out, um, they're reminded about how ugly that project is day in and day out. Um, they don't see the mitigation bank. And I really think of mitigation banking as something where you're restoring a natural area, not making an incremental improvement on an industrial uh, or commercial uh, project like a solar farm. So mitigation banking for natural areas um, and solar farm, pollinator friendly solar farm is a way of, you know, combining agriculture with solar and, you know, um, addressing, you know, potential community issues with regards to something that might look industrial, but can provide agricultural and ecological benefits. I'm good with that. Uh, Dan Rob did a great job. <laughs> well, that unfortunately takes us to our hour. I'm sure you both have a lot more to share and we have a lot of questions that we're gonna try to answer offline for folks that we didn't get to. Um, but I wanna thank you both, Rob, Jeremy, thank you very much for being with us and thank you everyone for participating in your excellent questions. Uh, again, the recording will be up on the USES website afterwards and uh, feel free to reach out through the contact us tab on the site if you have any other questions or would like to be uh, put in touch with any of these folks. So thank you guys both very much. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you, Uses. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks very much, Rob. Thanks, Dan.